There is good news for us today, and it comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter. <clears throat> Jesus is unwavering in his commitment to his mission in Jerusalem and will not be swayed by pettiness. In a series of striking cases in point, he calls his disciples to a similar single-mindedness. Now, the Gospel reading. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. <clears throat> Here we are, just eight days before the 4th of July, and our readings today are about freedom. Freedom, we say, is a human right, and we treasure freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom to pursue happiness. And we know also that people have had to make sacrifices for freedom. Some by serving in the military, others by working for a cause they are passionate about. It involves taking risk, being unpopular, and for many, the ultimate sacrifice of giving their own life. In the Galatians readings today, we have these famous words of St. Paul, for freedom, Christ has set you free. And it comes with a warning. Don't use freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. No rules, just right. That's the motto of a well-known restaurant change, Outback Steakhouse. But that's not freedom. No, it's, it's self-indulgence. And there are a multitude of examples that we can cite about people and cases ruled by, I'll do whatever I want. Don't bite or devour one another, says St. Paul. Anger and revenge can become very bitter. We know it not only from politics, from the discussion of social issues like abortion in our nation, but elsewhere as well, in our own churches and in our own homes and family. But Paul says something very interesting. He says that freedom in Christ produces the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Exercising freedom in Christ produces the fruits of the Spirit. Otherwise, it's something else. This past Tuesday evening, we had another of our What's Right conversations. And it was decided that future conversations will focus on the fruits of the Spirit. And now comes this lesson from Galatians. But when the fruits of the Spirit emerge, it is the freedom Jesus advocates. We know freedom does not mean that we are all going to agree or that we are all alike. Freedom respects differences. Freedom is concerned about the minority. It seeks to unite people, to live free of behaviors that divide and diminish life. We treasure our freedom in the United States, and we work to change what threatens that freedom. But none of our documents of our nation mention fruits of the Spirit, do they? Galatians reminds us of the way of Christ regarding freedom, in which it takes freedom to another level. We see what it meant for Elisha. He one day was suddenly called to be and to follow in the footsteps of the prophet Elijah. And what does he do? He frees himself from his past. He literally burns his bridges behind him, doing away with the implements of his life as a farmer. He decides to make a meal of the oxen he has used to plow and to use the wood of those implements to prepare the oxen as a meal. So demonstrating his devotion and a major change in his life. And then Jesus, we might be surprised that his single-minded devotion to his mission showed that he was not always sympathetic to people's excuses. He was focused on his mission to free the world of slavery to sin. It involved a significant commitment it involved his whole life, and he encourages his disciples to do the same. We find that freedom, the freedom Christ mentions, exists in unusual circumstances. When Paul found himself in prison, in prison he wrote one of his most encouraging letters. It went to the church in Philippi. Bars and walls, jails and prisons are no barrier for freedom and the fruit of the Spirit. It seems the more freedom is suppressed, the more intense the desire to work for freedom. You can be a prisoner and yet be free in Christ. It was true for Martin Luther King Jr., trapped in a racial culture. It was true for Nelson Mandela of South Africa. And wherever people feel trapped and confined, freedom shows up. Maybe in a job where unfair practices are part of the work environment, or in a marriage or a relationship, or because of one's social status, nationality, or sex. For us, though, who are set free in Christ, this freedom is a priceless treasure. 
We may at times choose not to act on this freedom, but it is always there for us, and it cannot be taken away. Every year when we observe Holy Week, we hear again the story of being set free. I like to think of it as our Independence Week. As Jesus confronts the powers wanting to enslave us, he does so not with weapons, but with love and words of truth. He speaks truth to the high priest and the religious leaders. He speaks truth to King Herod and Pilate, who represents Caesar. He submits willingly to carrying his cross to Calvary, endures the cruelty of soldiers and executioners, and then he forgives them all, saying they know not what they do. He commends his spirit to God, and his lifeless body is placed in a grave. But the prison of this grave could not contain him, for God, as we know, freed Christ from death, raised him to a new life, and assures us of no less. So, in eight days, we will remember on the 4th of July, 1776, in the Declaration of Independence, we will remember wars and other events in our nation that preserve our freedom. And we need to work to continue to preserve freedom for those of us who know Christ. We know that our freedom from sin is a done deal. By cross and an empty tomb, the major obstacles have been overcome. And we follow Christ as free people, free to suppress what challenges freedom with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And for us, every Sunday is an Independence Day when we come to care tell the story of Jesus and the meal that he offered. And we recall the impact of people as they lived out their calling of freedom. And we shout together, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then we'll sing our hymn. Please rise. Lord, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.